Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I want to thank you for joining us again this week on the program, and I trust that you are tuning in every week at the same time to follow the teaching series that we do through these broadcasts. We really take this time to really dig into the Word. You know, I travel all the time, and uh, you know, I go to a lot of different places, and many times I don't have uh, the consecutive days to really be able to unpack and teach a lot of the things that we're able to do through uh, our television ministry. So uh, I just uh, hope you're tuning in again e every week at the same time and that you're also telling your friends about us. We're in the middle of the series that we started to do. We're not in the middle of it. We're actually towards the end of it where we're talking about the seven I am's of Jesus. And we have taught six of them up to this point. And last week we began to film the seventh time in the book of John that Jesus says, I am. Now he tells us in John 20 that the purpose of the book of John is that these things have I written unto you that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life through his name. And what I began to show you as we started to walk through this incredible journey together is that when Jesus would say, I am, he would say that in contrast to something else that they thought was the I am. In other words, he said to them, I am the true bread that came down from heaven. But he said that in contrast to the statement, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead. You thought that was the bread, but that's not the bread. I'm the true bread that came down from heaven. Uh, we started to talk about I am the door. And when we talked about I am the door, we started to show you that, that Jesus said that anybody who tries to climb up some other way than through the door, the same as a thief and a robber. And I showed you that the some other way that they were trying to climb up into the sheepfold was through the door of performance Christianity, which was the law of Moses or the Old Covenant, and he says to them, but I'm the door. And so then we find out that he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we showed you the contrast to that was they thought that the way, the truth, and the life was through, again, performance Christianity. For he said to them, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. And you won't come to me that you might have life through my name. So he's the way, the truth, and the life. You thought you had life in searching the old covenant scriptures, but they were pointing to Christ. Now uh, we could go back through a whole lot of these, especially when he talks about I'm the light of the world. He begins to really, every one of these I am's also, he always is kind of hinting towards the fact that there's an inclusion not only of the Jews or of the 12 tribes, because see, the, the Gospel of John really does not begin with the Israel motif. It begins with the beginning of Genesis. So he's not just talking about the nation of Israel here. He's talking about, he takes it all the way back to Genesis and the inclusion of Adam and the human family that he would say, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1. John 1-1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the light became the light of men. It is interesting to me in Genesis that in the beginning God creates the heavens and the earth, and then he says, let there be light. I mean, when you lay John's gospel over Gen or John 1, 1, over Genesis 1, you see almost a direct parallel once again of this, in this inclusion. But again, he says to them, uh, in, in, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made in Him. And in Him alone is life, and that life became the light of men. And so that light shined in among the Gentiles, and it shined so that the statement was made early on uh, that he said to them uh, 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 down in, in uh, Bethsaida and, and Chorazon and uh, n the land of Naphtali and Zebulun, the people that sat in darkness 
saw a great light. And so uh, he's talking about the inclusion of the Gentiles, that that light was seen even among the Gentiles. And the mystery that had been hid from ages was that God was not going to just include the 12 tribes, but that he was going to include all of creation in his ongoing work of redemption. Now, you say, well, uh, man, I sure wish now that I'd have listened to the rest of the programs. Let me just say this very quickly before I continue in this series, that you can watch everything we've archived to date is on our YouTube channel. It is also uh, on our uh, iTunes podcast, the audio portions are, and there is also an RSS feed for your Android device. The easiest way to go back and review these or listen to them again is to simply go to my website and there is a link on this uh, on the tube right now where you can see my website in the lower uh, probably left hand corner or on this screen at lenhouse.com and there is an icon in the upper right hand corner for the YouTube channel, uh, the uh, little iTunes insignia and the little robot looking thing for Android. If you tap on any of them they will take you directly to uh, those feeds. They are free of charge to you. Uh, our partners are making that available through their partnership with us, and if you'd like to become a partner and help us also to distribute the gospel, we welcome that, but we want to make it available to you at no charge. You can actually subscribe to it at no charge, and then every time we upload something, you will be notified of it. This week we are dealing with I'm the Vine. John 15, we're going to come back in here because once again, they thought Israel was the vine, but that's not the vine. Jesus was the true vine. J John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. And uh, we contrasted that with Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 6, where he said, Now will I sing to my well beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it in and, and gathered out the stones thereof and planted with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could, have done, what could I have done more for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth fruit, it brought forth wild grapes. And now go to, and t uh, go, and now go to. I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I'm going to take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. That's exactly what happened to Jerusalem in A.D. 70. As God removed the hedge, the wall was torn down, the unfruitful branches were burned into fire, and God began to welcome into the vine not only Jews. There was a first fruit out of them. God did not altogether cast off His people according to Paul in the book of Romans because He Himself was a Jew. But He began to show that the point here is not your ethnic background. The point is, are you connected to the vine? I'm telling you that there is no optional way into the covenants of promise than through Jesus, who is the true vine. And he goes on to say in verse 6 of Isaiah, I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, there shall come up briars, thorns, and I will command the clouds that don't rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah is the pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Woe to them that join house to house, and join field to field, that there, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. He's telling you very clearly in Isaiah 9 here that you thought, I think this is Isaiah, you know, this is, that was Isaiah 5. He's telling you very clearly that you thought Israel and the house of Judah was the vine. But when you compare that with Matthew 21, it's almost word for word verbatim Isaiah 5. He says here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about, digged a wine press, and built a tower in it. And he let it out the husband and went to a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to his hus the husband that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will receive and reverence my son. But when the husbandman saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. 
when the Lord of their, therefore of that vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those wicked husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in due season. Jesus saith unto them, Did you ever read in the Scripture the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, The kingdom shall be taken from you, and given to a nation producing the fruits thereof. He's taking it from the natural nation of Israel and giving it to the holy nation of Israel that are part of the vine, Jesus Christ, that includes both Jew and Gentile, but where he breaks down the middle wall of partition and makes them one in Christ. I'm going to show you as we go on through here that Jesus has always been the true vine, and the issue is not the branches, the issue is the vine. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parable, they perceived hello, <laughs> that they spoke of them. They figured this out. These stories are about us. We're about to lose our inheritance. We're going to kill the son of the owner of the vineyard. It's going to be taken from us. The hedge is going to be pulled down. The fire is going to come. He's going to destroy their city. He's going to utterly destroy these wicked men. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because some took him to be a prophet. Now we went on down through here. And we shared in Isaiah, it's taken me a long time to come back a little bit here, but Isaiah 42 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. That's talking about Jesus. That's the same words that's used in the New Testament talking about him. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord that created the heavens, and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and the spirit to them that walketh therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will uphold thee, and will keep thee, and I will give thee, talking about Jesus, I am going to give you as a covenant for the people, for a light unto the Gentiles. In other words, the new covenant is in Jesus. And we are heirs to that new covenant because we are connected to Him through our new birth into Him who is the true vine. Listen, if we're not the Israel of God because of our connection through Jesus, then the new covenant is not given to us. Because he said, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel after those days, saith God. I will write my law upon their hearts and upon their minds and their sins and iniquities. I will remember no more. So if we are not a part of the true Israel of God, then we are not heirs of this covenant of promise. But what I want to show you again is this is not replacement theology. This is placement th theology. As a matter of fact, what I would call replacement theology is when you would take the national political nation of Israel and make them the promised seed rather than Christ who is the same one who was the promise was made to under Abraham where God said to him, your seed is going to bless the nations of the earth. I'm going to make your name great. And, 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 there, and he, he preached the gospel before unto Abraham, talking about Jesus literally being the offspring from the seed of Abraham. That would include both Jew and Gentile. So it's not, it's not replacing them. It's including them through being connected to the true vine so that this new covenant is with the Son. And because we are in the Son, we are connected with that new covenant. He tells them in Galatians 3 and 4, He did not make this promise to Abraham to seeds as of many, which was plural, but to one seed, just one seed, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And if you are in that vine, you cannot help but to produce fruit. Because of him, he said later on, you can do nothing. Hallelujah. And then he comes on in that same ninth chapter of Isaiah and prophesies that he would come to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out of the prisoners from the prison, and to bring them that sat in darkness out of the prison house. He said, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, 
Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth. I will tell you, sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth that go down to the sea, and all that is there in the isles of the inhabitants thereof. Now he tells them again, I'm going to give him Christ as the covenant for the people, and for a light to the Gentiles. Watch this. And he goes on to say that what he would do is open the eyes of the blind, set at liberty those that have been in prison, and them that sat in darkness would see a great light. That's the exact message that Jesus preached when he stood up in the temple and says, bring me the book of Isaiah. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to open the eyes of the blind, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to loose those that were in the prisons. In other words, everything that, that this scripture is prophesying concerning the true vine, Jesus fulfills it in the New Testament. Now, I don't know how you can get around that and not see that Jesus is the vine. You thought that was the vine. That's not the vine. This is the vine, and that's why we're singing a new song, because the new song is the new covenant, and the new thing that God was about to do was the new covenant. What's tragedy is we have yet the churches sometimes to really get a grasp on what it really means to be a new covenant church, because we try to mix the two covenants. He goes on to say in Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verses number 1 and 2, he said, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her, in her vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath light shine forth. Now this verse is fulfilled. Watch this. That's messianic prophecy, ladies and gentlemen. But it is fulfilled when we read Matthew 4, verses 12 through 17. It's almost verbatim quote. Now when Jesus has heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, we just read this in the verse above that, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and say to them, repent for the kingdom is at hand. In other words, he's giving the Jews opportunity to receive their kingdom, but the kingdom is going to be taken from them and given to the nation producing fruit. But what he's showing you again is that this light is breaking forth, not just among the twelve tribes, but also among the Gentiles, the people that sat in darkness are about to see a great light. That's the fulfillment of Isaiah. Now verse 3 of Isaiah 9 says, Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increase the joy. The joy before thee, according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called the Wonderful, the Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice. Behold, uh, uh, judgment and with justice from henceforth forever and ever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. I'm telling you, these are messianic prophecies of the inclusion of the Gentiles as well as believing Jews. But to those who will not, 
They're the branches that were cut down and cast into the fire. And we see this even when you see uh, talking about every battle is with noise and garments rolled in blood and with burning fuel and fire. And, and, uh, but, but he talks about in the midst of that that God would literally set up a kingdom which would never be removed. I wrote in my notes, compare this with the idea that Moses, uh, 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 Moses' covenant was about lambs and performance. But when John the Baptist preaches and points at Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb uh, of God. Because so Moses' covenant was based on woolly creatures called lambs, but Jesus in the, is the new covenant, and He in the new covenant, He is the true Lamb of God. So you thought this was the Lamb's, but this is the Lamb's. You thought this was the blood of the covenant, but this is the blood of the covenant. This real Son whom God has made, if you will, a covenant to the people where you and I are included in the covenants of promise as a result of that. And it goes on to, I went on to put in my notes that Jesus is the new covenant and He is the true Lamb of God. And He's not going to just restore the twelve tribes. He's going to be a light to the Gentiles as well. John's gospel is declaring, I am giving you to the whole world. The gospel of John does not begin with Genesis motif, as I've already shared with you. He does not start with the Jews. He starts clear back to the Garden of Eden to show that redemption is not just for Israel, but for the whole world. Isaiah 60 said, Arise and shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. I'm going to read some of this from my notes because it makes it a whole lot easier. He said, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit... He takes away, and every branch that beareth fruit, He purges it and brings forth more fruit. I put in my notes simply this. The branches He's talking about in this text are natural Israel. They were about to be cut off and cast into the fire. See Romans 11. Read the whole chapter. But especially this verse, we'll probably go there and read Romans 11 in a little while. You may also note that in Romans 10 verse 12, right before you get to Romans 11, where it's talking about all Israel being saved, he says in Romans 10, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek or the Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He noted that the prophet Isaiah said, who has believed our report in Romans 10, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And in verse 20 he said, Isaiah very boldly said, that's Romans 10 verse 20, he said, and Isaiah very boldly said, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest in, uh, I was made manifest for them that looked not for me, and uh, he, and, and that looked not for me, and he was literally talking about the Gentiles. He says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient people, talking about the Jews. So clearly the context of Romans is, is the removing of the unbelieving Jews, the branches that didn't produce, and the inclusion of the Gentiles, those who are coming into the covenants of promise through faith. Not only is it the inclusion of the Gentiles, but it is also the inclusion of believing Jews. The main point is that the true vine is not Israel, it is Jesus. All who are of faith, see if we say that the true vine is Israel, that ladies and gentlemen is replacement theology and that's what my accusers say I am. But what they're doing is they're replacing Jesus with a political, geographical people who are not believers and Jesus clearly said to them when He was on the planet, if you were Abraham's seed, you would believe, because Abraham's seed are the children of promise by faith. So I, I want you to see that uh, it was the inclusion of not just Gentiles, but one holy nation made up of both Jew and Gentile, uh, that it was the inclusion of them as well. Not only is the inclusion of the Gentiles, but also the inclusion of the believing Jews. The main point is that the true vine is not Israel, it is Jesus. All who are of faith are Abraham's seed. Jesus clearly taught this in the Gospels when He said, if you're Abraham's seed, you would have believed Me. I just quoted that. Therefore you are of your father. He tells him, you are of your father, the devil, because he was a liar from the beginning. So believing Jews and Gentiles are placed in the true vine and the true Israel, in the true Israel of God, which is Jesus, 
In the Old Testament, God said to Israel, Is my firstborn, and out of Egypt have I called my son. And in the New Testament, Jesus quotes this very scripture when Jesus goes down into Egypt fleeing from Herod, saying, So that the scripture might be fulfilled, out of Egypt have I called my son. Therefore, Jesus is the Israel of God, and he is the firstborn, he is the promised seed of Abraham. Now, that to me is pretty, pretty daggone good right there. Now, you know, uh, I'll, I'll come back and, and pick up a few things in this next one, but I, to me, I want you to just see that, that he goes on to tell them, if you abide in me, I, I, if you abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you accept you abide in me. In other words, he's telling natural Israel, you cannot, you're not going to produce any fruit. If you're not connected to the true vine, there is no way you're going to receive a life source that's going to cause you to produce much fruit. And fruit is not something that you manufacture. It is something that is the result of being connected to the right root. Here's the thing. We set beautiful centerpieces in our homes that maybe be a basket of fruit that we set on the table as a presentation of some kind of decorative thing. And it looks so real that you almost want to grab a peach out of that and take a bite of it. When you grab that peach, it looks real, but it's plastic with peach fuzz on it. What we've done is we've tried to make people produce fruit, and all they've produced is plastic fruit. You don't get fruit from trees by, by yelling at them, telling them to produce fruit, or I'm going to cut you down. You get fruit by connecting to the right root. And I would rather have a peach with a bug bite on it than I would a plastic piece of fruit that has no substance, it has no, it has no nutritional value in it. I'm telling you, God wants to bring forth a nation that will produce fruit. And the only way we can produce fruit is by simply abiding in the vine and allowing Him to prune us and develop us to bring forth much fruit unto God. Thank you for joining us again this week. We're about to run out of time again. Uh, join us again next week as we look deeper into this again. I hope you're enjoying this. If you would like to sow a seed into our ministry and help us take the gospel around the world, we do need your help and we need more partners to be able to sustain and increase our ministry. If you'd like to become a partner with us, it's very easy. You can go to my website and at the place where you give via credit card, you can set up your debit card, your credit card, uh, for a recurring amount monthly that would help us. Or you can give a one-time gift there. You could also send check or money orders to the address on the screen to Lynn House Ministries, and the address will come up on the screen. You could also sow into our ministry by calling the number on the screen. Someone will take your call. If you don't get an answer, we have such a volume, leave a message and we will try to call you back. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. The word repentance means to change your mind. The message of John the Baptist and of Jesus was to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is accessed by a change in our thinking. If you are in outer darkness, there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That reality is not always out in the distant future. It is in people's lives right now. One simple mind shift can move you out of darkness and weeping and into light and rejoicing. God wants to wipe all tears from our eyes and replace our weeping with joy.